Breaking developments coming in. Times now has access the white paper on Indian economy being presented by the government of India. Ministry of Finance is presenting a report card of what they had inherited from the UPA government before them, as well as the performance of the ten years. Some of the highlights that are mentioned in this very detailed white paper, which is approximately sixty pages long, that is going to be presented on the floor of the house. It talks about how UPA government inherited a healthy economy, ready for more reforms, but eventually made it non-performing in its 10 years. This is a report card of UPA government's performance between 2004. to 2014 as promised by nirmala sitaraman on the day of budget they have now come out with details of what was the status of economy that nda government had inherited and how they have worked to bring it to the level that it is at right now which is that india is now the fifth largest economy in the world and is looking at becoming number 3 economy madhav run us through the highlights of this document that has been accessed by times now first well yes uh, pragya has access this document uh, and in fact uh, let's take you through the cover page this is of course a white paper on the indian economy government of india as it's rightly mentioned over there and of course uh, going through the various details just a few moments ago it's been tabled uh, in the lok sabha and in fact talking about the details as far as the indian economy is concerned let's start with this an overview says that in 2014 when we formed the government the government the economy was in fragile state public finances were in bad shape there was economic mismanagement financial indiscipline and there was widespread corruption there was a crisis situation the responsibility to mend the economy step by step and put the government systems in order was enormous our government refrained from bringing out a white paper on the poor state of affairs then that would have given a negative narrative and shaken the confidence of all including investors the need of the hour was to give hope to the people to attract investments both domestic and global and build support for the much needed reforms the government believed in nation first and not in scoring political points now that we have stable Analyze the economy and set it on a recovery and growth path. It is necessary to place in the public domain the seemingly insurmountable challenges left behind as a legacy by the UPA government. Every challenge of the pre-2014 era was overcome through our economic management and our governance. These have placed the country on a resolute path of sustained high growth. This has been possible through right policies, true intentions, and appropriate decisions. Uh, the objectives of the white paper are stated. It seeks to apprise the honourable. members of parliament and people of india of the nature extent of governance economic and fiscal crises that were bequeathed on this government when it assumed office in 2014 second it informs the honorable members of parliament and public about the policies measures that our government took to restore the health of the economy make it vigorous and capable of fulfilling the growth aspirations of the people in the present and in the amrit kal and in doing so hopes to generate a wider more informed debate on the paramountcy of national interest and fiscal responsibility in matters of governance over political expediency fourth to commit ourselves to national development with new aspirations new consciousness new resolutions as the country opens up immense possibilities and opportunities also uses the term upa government for the government led by dr manmohan singh elected to office 2020 to 2004 and our government for the india government led by shri narendra modi elected to office 2014 in part 1 the macroeconomic situation of india has been referred to in part 2 there's a given the current status of the various corruption scams of the upa government part 3 shows how we turned the economy around rebuilt the country's image and rekindled people's hopes and aspirations for a better future now the nation marches ahead with self confidence and self belief uh it goes on and on to talk about the various details this is part 1 which where talks about the upa government inherited a healthy economy ready for more reforms but made it non performing in its 10 years in 2004 when the upa government began its term the economy was growing at 8% with industry and services sector growth above 7% each and a resuscitating agricultural sector growth above 9% in fy04 amidst a benign world economic environment the economic survey of 2003 for noted the economy of appears to be in a resilient mode in terms of growth inflation and balance of payments a combination that offers large scope for consolidation of the growth momentum with continued macroeconomic stability ironically the upa leadership itself seldom fails to take credit for the 1991 reforms abandoned them 
after coming to power in 2004. Very serious charge over here. Even as the country was standing at the cusp of emerging as a powerful economy, little was done by the UPA government to build upon the strong foundation laid by the previous NDA government. In the last years, between 2004 and 2008, the economy grew fast thanks to the lag effects of the reforms of the NDA government and favorable global conditions. The UPA government took credit for the high growth but did little to consolidate it. The failure to take advantage of the years of high growth to strengthen the budget position of the government and invest in infrastructure to boost future growth prospects stood exposed, as aptly put by a noted economist, the high growth and low inflation of the first five years were due mainly to the global economic boom of 2002-2007 and the wide-ranging productivity enhancing economic reforms carried out prior to 2004. The UPA government's economic policies were mediocre to start with and worsened increasingly as the decade involved. And they've given the reference, of course, of Shankar Acharya, UPA's economic legacy, good, bad or ugly over there, the business standard uh, referred to over there. Going forward to say that the UPA government was in its quest to maintain high economic growth by any means after the global financial crisis of 2008 severely undermined the macroeconomic foundations. According to economic observers, the economy reeled under profound mismanagement and indifference. Fundamentally, the decade of the UPA government failed to undertake economic, social and administrative reforms to strengthen India's long-term economic potential despite the golden opportunity offered by the years of high growth and investment. We want to further say that one such foundation that was severely weakened by the UPA government was price stability. Inflation raised between 2009 and 2014 and the common man bore the brunt. High fiscal deficits for six years between FY09 and FY14 heaped misery on ordinary and poorer households over the five-year period from FY10 to FY14. The average annual inflation rate was in double digits. Between FY04 and FY14, average annual inflation in the economy was 8.2%. There's a chart here that talks about inflation trend in UPA years. You can see in FY04, it is 3.9, uh, 3.8 in FY06. FY5, FY06, it goes to 4.4, then 6.7, rising, uh, falling marginally to 6.2, rising to 9.1% in FY09. In FY10, it peaks at 12.3. In FY11, it is at 10.5. FY12 continuing to remain slightly less at 9.5, again rising to 10 and then falling to 9.4%. This is a trend of inflation in UPA years. They've gone on to say that bad debts in the banking system, the banking crisis was one of the most important and infamous legacies of the UPA government. When the Vajpayee led NDA government took office, the gross non-performing assets or GNPA ratio in public sector banks was 16%. And when they left office, it was 7.8%. In September 2013, this ratio, including restructured loans, had climbed to 12.3%, largely because of political interference by the UPA government in the commercial lending decisions of public sector banks. Worse, even that high percentage of bad debts was an underestimate. So this is a chart showing the rise in the non-performing assets during the UPA years. This is as far as March 11 is concerned, March 10. You can see how it rises in September 13. Once again, rise over here, this is as far as all state uh, commercial banks are concerned, public sector banks over here, OPBs and NPBs, FBs. All these banks are together being put in this particular chart and they all talk about 13 being pretty much the year where these loans have peaked and the restructured standard advances to total advances. So the yellow that you see is the restructured uh, standard advances to total advances and you can see the yellow portion increasing year on year pretty much as far as the various sectors that have been mentioned here are concerned. It also goes on to say that the banking crisis in 2014 was massive. The absolute sum at stake was too large. Gross advances by the public sector banks were only 6.6 .6 lakh crores in March 2004. In March 2012, it was 39 lakh crores. Further, not all problem loans were recognized. There was much under the hood. According to a Credit Suisse report, Published in March 2014, the top 200 companies with an interest coverage ratio of less than 1 owed about 8.6 lakh crore to the banks. That's a massive amount. Nearly 44% of those loans, 3.8 lakh crore rupees, were yet to be...
be recognized as problem assets. That alone would have added another 6.7% to the GNPA ratio. In 2018, in a written response to a parliamentary panel, a former governor of the Reserve Bank of India stated, a larger number of bad loans were originated in the period 2006 to 2008, and this note was prepared by Professor Raghuram Rajan in September, 2000, September 6, 2018, at the request of the chairman of the Parliamentary Estimates Committee, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi. So very important over here that the actual number of uh, bad loans was sought to be addressed in terms of the figure and in fact the actual number of them was much larger than that was actually published is what is being stated in this particular white paper as well. They're going on to talk about the elevated external vulnerability in an era where capital flows dominate India's external vulnerability shot up because of over dependence on external commercial borrowings or ECBs. During the UPA government's tenure ECB rose at a compounded annual growth rate or CAGR of 21.1% FY04 to FY14, whereas in the nine years from FY14 to FY23, they have grown at an annual rate of 4.5%. No surprise, therefore, that our economy was in a vulnerable position in 2013 when the US dollar rose sharply. The UPA government had compromised external and macroeconomic stability and the currency plunged in 2013 from its high to low against the US dollar between 2011 and 2013 the Indian rupee plunged 36%. This is what is being stated here in chart 3. The free fall of the Indian rupee between 2011 and 2013. Starting over here at Jan... 11 is the uh, uh, is the time that has been given over here. The US dollar to INR ratio is at 0.022%. It rises and falls marginally over here till about May and post May, it starts falling to about 0.019. Again rises sharply, but through these rises and falls, finally comes in uh, about September 20 uh, September 13 to about point. 0.15 from 0.22. This is a chart showing the free fall of the Indian rupee in those two years between 2011 and 2013. They further talk about the foreign exchange crunch and the FCNRB window. The famous foreign currency non-resident or FCNRB deposit window for NRIs was actually a call for help when there was a large depletion of foreign exchange reserves under the UPA government. Foreign exchange reserves that had declined from around USD 294 billion in July 2011 to around USD 256 billion in August 2013. By the end of September 2013, Forex reserves were just enough to finance little over six months of imports, down from 17 months in end March 2004. Forex reserves to external debt ratio tanked from 95.8% in FY11 to 68.8% in FY14. To salvage an ever worsening situation, the RBI opened a special window for FCNRB to attract USD deposits at a high premium in August to September 2013. The costly solution to the above self-created predicament reeked of a rerun of the 1991 situation where India had to approach the IMF for assistance during a balance of payments crisis. However, a dubious distinction from 1991 is that the amount raised from NRIs through FCNRB USD 26.6 billion was 12 times the 1991 IMF bailout which was USD 2.2 billion. The redemption of this high cost dollar debt was left for left behind for discharge in FY16, a liability that has since been honored by a government without disruption. They've also gone on to talk about another aspect, which is mismanagement of public finances. The UPA government's response to the 2008 global financial crisis, a fiscal stimulus package to combat the spillover effects, was much worse than the problem it sought to address. It was way beyond the capacity of the union government, this white paper says, to finance and sustain. Interestingly, the stimulus did not seem to bear any correlation with the outcomes it sought to achieve because our economy was not unduly affected by the crisis. During the GFC, India's growth slowed to 3.1% in FY09, but recovered swiftly to 7.9% in FY10, Table 1, a cross-country Analysis using IMF data on real GDP growth during and after the GFC corroborates the fact that the impact on the Indian economy was relatively limited compared to other developed and developing economies. There was no need for the continuation of the misguided stimulus beyond one year. Table 1 showing how India was not badly affected by the GFC 2008, comparing emerging economies as well as the developed economies. India over here in 2008 3.9 and at 8.5. Let's go further to look at the various other aspects of this. The UPA government's finance minister in one of his speeches 
in 2011 admitted as much. India, unlike most of the economies, was not seriously affected by the financial turmoil of 2008 in the developed world. Under the UPA government, public finances were brought to a perilous state. For six consecutive years between FIO9 and FIO14, the ratio of India's gross financial deficit or GFD to gross domestic product of GDP was at least 4.5%. It was between 4.5% and 5% of GDP in three of the six years, between 5% and 6% okay. in one. and more. So than a host of issues spoken of by the NDA Sarkar 